Happy Black Friday, Dog Nation. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Kroger. I hope and I trust that all of you had a terrific Thanksgiving. I know that I did. Great time with family, delicious food, and just an opportunity to kind of celebrate the things that I think we all appreciate this time of year and then sort of turn our attention now to a holiday season heading towards Christmas that's obviously going to be a lot of fun. But for Georgia, a lot of business to be taken care of before that, before the halls can be decked with boughs of holly. Georgia's got an in-state rival, Georgia Tech to handle, an SEC championship, and we hope a college football playoff. So a lot of football here still going on, even though we're kind of into that deep holiday season, Thanksgiving, turning the corner from that, Christmas on the horizon. So we're glad to kind of have you with us to sort of celebrate all of that here today. I always like to be here the day after Thanksgiving because it's always the day before Georgia takes on Georgia Tech. We'll preview that today. Unfortunately, we will deal with the bad news of what looks to be another injury to Lawrence Cager and one apparently that's being treated as something pretty serious right now. So we'll kind of do that off the top. That's kind of a uh, certainly a mood dampener on a day when I think otherwise we feel pretty good about life. So we'll deal with the Cager thing. Jeff Sintel will be here. We'll talk some recruiting with him. George may be on commitment watch for today. We'll let Jeff tell us more about that here coming up. It is all on the way next as Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Kroger, begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Kroger, fresh for everyone. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. All right, picture this scene just for a moment. You bring in some extended family into your home for Thanksgiving. You welcome them in. You give them some delicious food. You give them a place to sleep. And Friday morning, Black Friday, where we are right now, they wake up and say, Whoa, I tell you what, your hospitality has been so great. The food has tasted so good. The bed's been so comfortable. The home experience here is so cozy and warm. We've decided to stay through the weekend. Imagine that scene here for a moment. That news being hit with that on the Thanksgiving week. Well, that's a little bit like the news that Georgia fans have been hit across the face with a two-by-four with when it comes to Lawrence Cage, the Georgia wide receiver, dating back to Wednesday's practice. Our first time to get a chance to talk about this here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger, given the fact that we were off yesterday for Thanksgiving. Let me read you the way it was reported by Mike Griffith at DogNation.com. Georgia receiver Lawrence Cager, Griffith writes, suffered a, quote, serious ankle injury in Wednesday's practice that could potentially prove season-ending according to a source with knowledge of the situation. So obviously, Cager, who has been such an important part of the Georgia offense, more on that in a moment, and a guy that's really dealt with injuries all season long, whether it be shoulder, ribs, you can now add ankle to that, and this one may be the worst of all because of the time that it comes and the fact that it's serious enough that it's at least being suggested by sources close to Griffith that are sources that Griffith's close to, I guess is, is the better way to say that. They, that Cager may not play again in the 2019 season. And obviously you can read between the lines and say the farther Georgia progresses in the in the push for a college football playoff berth and a national championship maybe makes it more likely that Cager will eventually be healthy enough to play in time this year. I don't have to tell you how serious this is. Cager's been a huge part of the Georgia offense. And it obviously comes at a time during the year when all coaches are kind of dealing with just the challenge of being healthy enough for the games that matter most. In fact, ironically, before the cager injury on Wednesday, Kirby Smart spent some time talking on Tuesday about the task at hand for all coaches, making sure that the practice you have are effective, which means physical, while also making sure that the players that you have are healthy enough to play uh, down the stretch. Here's how Kirby s- spoke on Tuesday night about trying to strike that balance. Here's the Georgia coach. I would say Scott and Zimmer and staff have a tremendous part of that. We take pride in that, but I mean, they lift hard. I think our depth is what prevents that a lot of times. I mean, there's been significant injuries to me when you think about Cager and Tyler Simmons and D-Rob at, at, at a position that we were very light in. Those were kind of significant to me. Now, if you're talking about quarterback and you know running back, it's probably not the case. But um, we've had we've had more this year on the offensive line, it seems, than we've normally had. Um, but it, the Scots, the strength staff does a tremendous job. I mean, we're one of the healthiest teams year in and year out because of what they do in the weight room. But we also have a, a really good, deep roster that allows us to be competitive and physical in practice because you're maybe not as concerned about losing a guy uh, in practice because we got we got good good depth. I mean, it's not great, but it's good depth in a lot of positions. So uh, our kids push hard through it. So listen, I think that's very well said by Kirby Smart, and obviously he speaks those words before the latest cager injury, the ankle on Wednesday. 
as reported to DogNation.com. But nonetheless, I think what Kirby says there is relevant for the situation that George is dealing with when it comes to Cager. And I think that you can extrapolate from Kirby's words. If he were here sitting next to me right now talking about this latest Cager injury, here's the thing that I think, here's the thing I think that he would say, and he would be 100% correct to say this. The Lawrence Cager injury, the latest one, the ankle, that isn't a reason Georgia won't win the SEC. And if Georgia doesn't win the SEC and make its way into the college football playoff, Cager's injury won't be an acceptable excuse for why that didn't happen. Cager injury should not solely prevent Georgia from winning. And if it does prevent Georgia from, or if Georgia does go on not to win in the SEC, not make the college football playoff, no one's going to be standing up and saying, well, it's understandable that Georgia lost because it didn't have Lawrence Cager. Kirby talked about that in the clip you just, you just heard, that Georgia uses depth to battle back against these injuries. There's really not a ton you can do to prevent them, no matter how great your strength and conditioning staff is, and Georgia's seemingly under Scott Sinclair is a very good one. There is just an aspect of the injury bug that is just very difficult, difficult to control. Football is a violent sport played by big physical guys that have incredible speed, incredible athleticism. When they collide into each other, there is going to be some shrapnel for that, for, from that, and there are going to be some injuries that occur from time to time. You can't do everything to prevent an injury, but you can do a lot to prevent an injury from ending your season. And the cager injury, no matter how valuable he's been to Georgia up to this point in time, it should not be the thing that prevents Georgia from winning the SEC. Now, I say that knowing full well how valuable Cager has been thus far this season. In fact, David Hale, writer for ESPN on Twitter this week, ironically as well, given the fact that what Hale tweeted, he tweeted before the serious injury to Cager, but uh, kind of laid out just how valuable Cager's been here this year. This is kind of stat heavy for a minute, but try to follow me on this. So what David Hale writes is... Um, these are all on throws behind, you know, beyond the line of scrimmage for Jake Fromm. With Cager on the field, Fromm is completing 73.3% of his passes for nine touchdowns, just one pick, with a 190.1 passer rating and 10.8 yards per attempt. However, when Cager's not on the field, which for the foreseeable future is going to be the case, Fromm this season, 45.7% completion percentage, five touchdowns, two interceptions, Passer rating drop down, drops down to 107.2, and the yards per attempt drop down to 6.03. So just highlight that last number here for a moment. Yards per attempt going from 10.8 to 6.3. Completion percentage goes from 73.3 to 45.7. Touchdowns almost cut in half. Interceptions doubled when Georgia's not playing with Lawrence Cager on the field. So that's obviously a statistical picture that paints kind of a dire view of Georgia playing without Lawrence Cager. But once again, at this stage of the season, even an injury to Lawrence Cager should not be the kind of thing that upends the Georgia season. So it's probably worth us having a little bit of a conversation from kind of a solutions-based perspective of, well, how it is it that Georgia weathers this storm? First of all, when you think about your freshman receivers, guys like Dominic Blaylock and George Pickens, and it's been pointed out that those guys arrived in the summer didn't have the value, the luxury of being able to go through a spring practice, didn't have all that, and that's certainly true. But now on Saturday, Georgia's about to play its 12th game. When it plays uh, against LSU, that'll be the 13th game. If these guys were playing for a school like Ole Miss or a school like Vanderbilt or somewhere like that, the 13th game for them would be the first game of their sophomore season. It just so happens that the 13th game for Georgia is a continuation of the 2019 season. So for all intents and purposes, Cager and I'm sorry, Pickens and Blaylock, they're not freshmen anymore. Okay. They are playing now in a number of games that would put them beyond the first season of play for many players in college football. And I think you saw some examples of this against Texas AM on Saturday. Big catch that Blaylock has late, touchdown that George Pickens scores, another big moment for him. I mean, I think you see these guys kind of coming into their own. It doesn't completely obscure the fact that Lawrence Cager has been incredibly valuable, and if you could wave a magic wand and have him healthy, you would definitely want to do that, just given how, much, how successful the Georgia offense has been with him on the field. But at this point in time, it is certainly fair to say, all right, Pickens, all right, Blaylock, now time for you to take the next step. Now time for you to show just how much you've developed. I don't think that's asking too much from these freshmen because being young freshmen not exactly what they are anymore. And that obviously means that Pickens is going to probably occupy the spot in the defensive mind that maybe Cager once did, meaning getting the most attention from a top cornerback here. We kind of understand that. We go back to the Florida game, pretty good secondary. Remember how you know Cager came up with so many big catches for Georgia there you know, uh, in that game, and 
a lot of that came facing a cornerback that's likely going to one day be in the NFL. Cager was just really good at sort of doing battle with these elite SEC level cornerbacks. And now George Pickens is going to have to do the uh, same kind of thing. But without Cager, knowing that all of a sudden now the various defensive backs are kind of focusing in on different Georgia wide receivers, it might also be a thing where Jake Fromm is now kind of looking down his own pecking, art, pecking order chart a little bit. Instead of throwing to uh, Pickens exclusively, battling the other team's top cornerback, maybe you're kind of looking down to see what a Demetrius Robertson is doing or seeing what a Kiaris Jackson is doing. You know, seeing what those guys are doing against sort of a lesser defensive back in the pecking order for an opponent like LSU. I'll also say this, that the opportunity of playing without Lawrence Cager is a chance for Jake Fromm to kind of reestablish one of the things that's always made him such a top quarterback in college football. I know the accuracy for Fromm over the last three games hasn't been where it needs to be, nor where it once was, but I think that's part of the formula here too. Fromm's got to find a collection of easy throws to make. It's something that John Stinchcomb talked about when he joined us on Monday's edition of Dog Nation Daily. Finding those easy throws that kind of provide the opportunity for Fromm to regain some of his confidence, but also kind of provide an opportunity to take advantage of the defense is willing to give you, knowing that now a guy like George Pickens is going to see a whole bunch of bracket coverage and see a whole bunch of really top flight, uh, you know, uh, defensive backs trying to, you know, st- run with him step for step. And the other thing is, when it comes to the LSU game next Saturday, now that it looks like Georgia won't have Lawrence Cage for that game, maybe not quite officially, but certainly almost for certain, it's a reminder of the thing that the Georgia offense is supposed to be doing so well anyway which is running the football. That's the bread and butter for Georgia. That's the thing that's gotten them on the doorstep of winning the SEC and returning back to college football playoff. And ultimately, the success formula for against LSU will also include a whole bunch of running the ball there as well. So the Cager injury certainly is serious, and it's certainly one of those things where, <laughs> given the track record of the first 11 games of the season, obviously Georgia looks very different when Cager's on the field compared to when he's not. But that doesn't mean Georgia can't win without him. And that doesn't mean that some of the receivers who've been learning under Cager this year aren't ready to step up and take that next step. So if you're a Georgia fan, obviously you're bothered by what happened to Cager, but I don't think it should eliminate your confidence that Georgia can still put together a winning offensive game plan for LSU next Saturday and obviously Georgia Tech this Saturday. This is the kind of thing that Georgia is supposed to be built to overcome. It's supposed to have the depth to withstand injuries. And next Saturday, we'll find out if that version of Georgia really is the real version that's going to be on the field. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're presented today by Kroger, and we're glad to have you with us live on video, 10 a.m., Dog Nation Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. No radio for us today. A little holiday time for the folks in Athens on 960 The Ref. But we'll look forward to being back with them again on Monday. And, of course, we're glad to have you with us in podcast form. Wherever you find them, Apple, Google, the worldfamousdognation.com. Just really glad to have you with us today. We'll get Jeff Sintel here coming up in a moment. Before that, let me give you a quick uh, word from my friends at Kroger. I mentioned before that you know holiday season kind of fast approaching here. We're kind of turned the corner past Thanksgiving. All systems pointing towards Christmas now. And of course, Kroger's got you covered as we get ready for the holiday season. Home decor, gift cards, gift wrapping essentials, toys, everything else. You can get all of that at your local Kroger. You can also start saving, big-time savings. Uh, up to a 30% off when you shop there at your local Kroger store. So make sure you check that out as we head towards the holiday season. Before we get Jeff's intel, let me also get ready to go around the doghouse. Presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. And we'll push the cager injury to the side for the moment and kind of focus solely in on the game against Georgia Tech on Saturday because I think there was a large belief that Cager probably wasn't going to play in this game anyway. So the evaluation of dogs versus jackets really isn't all that different just given the fact that uh, Cager is not going to be playing, at least for all intents and purposes, against Georgia Tech tomorrow. So let me start with something that Kirby Smart said about Georgia Tech this week, you know, kind of getting used to what is a very different looking offense now with Jeff Collins as head coach compared to what was in play with Paul Johnson for a number of years and watching Tech try to grow over the course of a season. I mean, no one's going to sugarcoat this. Transitioning from a roster that was built for triple option offense to kind of more of a more traditional football offense, the way that Jeff Collins wants to run for the Jackets, that's a huge, huge a transition to try to make. There are going to be a lot of growing pains associated with that. Tech has lost to the Citadel this year, for instance. But, you know, maybe playing a little bit better here lately, gave it a game, close game against Virginia, beat North Carolina State. So maybe Tech finding a little bit of footing here in kind of the uh, final quarter pole of the season, at least Kirby Smart has seen some areas of improvement for the Jackets and studying them on film for the full year 
Kirby seems to see some areas in which they're getting better. Here's what Kirby said about the opponent for the dogs on Saturday. I think their offense has grown. and uh, They got better and better from the beginning of the year towards the end of the year. It's like two different teams. I think they're, they were learning a new system. And any time you're learning a new system and you have growing pains and you push through those, um, their quarterback's done a tremendous job. We know him well, recruited him out of high school. Uh, James has been extremely athletic and uh, he's, he's gotten better throwing the ball with every game. He threw the ball with a lot of confidence Thursday night um, and their team's growing. So obviously Kirby says some nice things there about Georgia Tech. I mean, what Kirby can't really say, but we all know to be true, is is this is supposed to be a game that Georgia's supposed to dominate, right? Georgia's a 28-point favorite. This is supposed to be an easy win for Georgia, and Kirby can't come out and say that. He's got to treat the, uh, the opponent with respect. But the idea of it's supposed to be an easy win, I think kind of brings to mind a narrative that I'm not quite so sure is as true as some fans think it is, that maybe Georgia hasn't handled these easy games this year as well as it should. You've heard it said a million times that, Oh, you know, Georgia just plays the level of its competition. It plays great at Auburn, or at least plays well enough to win. It plays well enough to win in Jacksonville against Florida. But against some of these lesser teams this year, Georgia's kind of stubbed its toe. And obviously the loss to South Carolina is what overwhelmingly contributes to that narrative. We all understand that. But post-South Carolina game, I'm not quite so sure that the narrative of Georgia not handling its business is quite as accurate as some people think it is. I mean, Georgia definitely didn't cover the spread a week ago against Texas A&M, and the only reason we mentioned the spread is simply because that's the only number we have that kind of measures true expectations for a game. Georgia was supposed to win last week by two touchdowns. It only won by one. But prior to that, Georgia had actually been in a pretty good run here before uh, that. You know, taking care of business, as I said before, at Auburn, uh, covering the spread against Missouri, uh, winning 27 nothing there in that game, the Florida game. We've always talked about that. Everybody has bad memories of the Kentucky game because of the rain, because of how much the Georgia offense sputtered in the first half. It was scoreless at halftime. But Georgia, as about a 24-point favorite, ended up winning by 21. You certainly can't say that wasn't much of a blowout. Prior to the South Carolina loss, Georgia had also covered the spread on the road at Tennessee. So, you know, the idea that Georgia has kind of played below expectations against lesser competition, I'm not quite so sure the numbers quite back that up as much as some people think it does. And on Saturday, no doubt, that's going to be one of the things that people are curious of. In that final tune-up before the SEC championship game, can Georgia go out and make what is supposed to be an easy game look easy? I don't need to see a lot of style points. I don't need to see the Georgia throwing the ball all over the yard because doing that against Tech doesn't mean anything for me in terms of how that'll go against a much better team against LSU. But admittedly, finding a way to make this game easy and sort of put it on ice in the first half would give Georgia a chance to rest a lot of guys in the second half and get some experience for some guys who could be big parts of the story in 2020. So making it easy against Tech on Saturday, Georgia having the ability to do that, yeah, I'll admit I'm a little curious about that. It's Around the Doghouse. It's presented by Merriweather and Tharp. And obviously the holiday season is great for most of us, but for some of us it can also be the kind of a reminder of either a situation that feels like it may be going wrong and maybe a marriage that's uh, maybe about to come to an end. If you, if you find yourself in that spot, I know it can be scary. I know it can be stressful. It's the kind of conversation you never thought you would be having and you wish you didn't have to have it right now. But if you are in that scenario, here's what I'll tell you, is that having an advocate on your side is incredibly important. And that it may seem like there's no possibility for any kind of like happy ending here to ever have the pieces put back together again. But trust me, Merriweather and Tharp has been through this thousands of times. They are your source for Georgia divorce, and they can put you on a path that will uh, lead you feeling whole again with your family, your finances, and everything else. But you need to have them by your side. It's important to have an advocate who has the experience, who has the expertise in something like this. And that's why I would invite you to go to this website, uh, theatlantadivorceteam.com. That's theatlantadivorceteam.com. That will help you get in touch with my friends at Merriweather and Tharp, and they will be a tireless advocate for you as you go through was admittedly a tough situation but Merriweather and Tharp knows how to get you through it it's uh, the Atlanta divorce team.com to get in touch with Merriweather and Tharp all right it's great to have you with us here today on dog nation daily presented by Kroger on the show later on I'll have more from Kirby Smart talking about the upcoming matchup with the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets for now though on a little bit of UGA recruiting let's get ready to say hello to Jeff Sintel From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. All right, Jeff, before we're done, I want to get your thoughts on the Lawrence Cager injury, uh, as was reported at DogNation.com on Wednesday. Before that, though, a little bit of recruiting stuff. And right here off the top, some wishes that you had a happy Thanksgiving with your family and your friends and everybody else. I know that you love the holiday as much as I do, and I hope you got a chance to enjoy it. 
Hey, Brandon, man, it's great. Um, always try to get together around family. Always try to... Uh, we even established a little new tradition. What we did was we, uh, we all wrote down what we're thankful for, and we put it in a bowl. Wow. Um, after we said our blessing, and then uh, we had people go around the room reading off one by one what everybody said anonymously, and then we all tried to pick who said it. So uh, the little people got a good got a good kick out of that as well. The young, young folks in the family got a good kick out of that as well. Well, that sounds like a really nice time, and we appreciate you being a part of our program here today. Let me start with this. Obviously, there's this thought that uh, Georgia fans hope to be on maybe commitment watch here this week, and Black Friday be just as good a time as any for that to happen. Zykevius Walker thought to be – Going with an announcement here off the official visit he took to Georgia last Saturday, uh, I guess, Jeff, you're kind of much that same way, kind of in that waiting pattern, that holding pattern, to see if we get any kind of news from Walker here on Friday. And I guess as I say this here in the 10 o'clock hour, by the time a lot of folks either watch this show or hear this show, they may know more about Walker than I do right now. But that's obviously the next piece of news that fans are expecting to see a little bit more of uh, here this week. Anything new to report on Zykevius Walker? Uh, well, the Kiwi Walker could be one of two things. He could have waited until Grandma's pumpkin pie was gone, or he could have just waited until Georgia has scored 5,123 points against Georgia Tech. And that might be what he's waiting for for his commitment watch, because that would be one point for every citizen of Sly County, Georgia, for Zakevius Walker. He took his four official visits all over the last month. Georgia got the last at bat. He was said to be making his decision. Thanksgiving week while he's surrounded by friends and family. Yeah, so we'll just kind of see uh, how that goes and uh, obviously kind of play that out. And it's kind of funny, Jeff, you know, over the years, this is one of those things where, you know, these holiday weekends always seem to kind of push guys towards commitments. A lot, you know, a lot of times it's, it's you know, a grandmother's birthday, mom's birthday, whatever else. But, you know, certainly as someone who's done this for a living for a long time, you can kind of think back to kind of always be on guard for that kind of holiday commitment announcement because whether it's one that kind of pops up in a surprising fashion or one that is you know, planned, this, this time of year, these types of you know, holiday events kind of always seem to bring that out, don't they? Yeah, I think the other thing that makes it complicated from an insider's perspective is uh, lots of times these young men have to find some way to present their decision, whether it's a video edit, whether it's a tweet, whether it's a notepad, or whether it's an edit that's being produced by somebody else. And sometimes the only holdup for folks that want to have a commitment to celebrate while they're uh, going through turkey sandwiches and turkey casserole and um, bourbon, pecan, chocolate pie, or something like that, is they uh, have to get all that stuff put together, and sometimes that takes time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's a very modern problem, I guess, to have here when it comes to the 2020 class to get your edit or your video together before you're able to make your announcement. Kind of a funny thing to think about. By the way, speaking of edits on Twitter, I saw kind of an interesting one from 2020 quarterback C.J. Stroud, who, much like Walker, was on campus for Georgia this past weekend for an official visit for the Texas A&M game. He kind of tweeted out, I guess this is an official offer, blessed, the, uh, blessed to have earned my first SEC offer from the University of Georgia. That's C.J. Stroud on Twitter. Does that announcement from him, does that change anything here, the fact that it's officially offered? Does that mean that, you know, I, as you've said before, a lot of this obviously kind of centers around what Jake Fromm does, and if Fromm were to return, then Stroud's probably not much of a player in the Georgia picture at all. But does the does this announcement, this statement from Tra- Stroud on Twitter, does that does that change much with the C.J. Stroud Georgia story here for the moment? Well, a lot of schools, Brandon, they don't give out the official offer until you come visit. Uh, so C.J. Stroud actually took an official visit to Georgia without the offer, and that's possible to do these days, but. A lot of people saw that, Brandon, and they were thinking, you know, why is the rest of the country sleeping on C.J. Stroud, especially since he was your Elite 11 MVP this summer? He like he's capable of making every throw. And he is, folks, he's rated as a pro-style quarterback, plays from a really strong pocket, strong region of California high school football, um, Rancho Cucamonga, California. And um, he's not like the dual threat type. If you look at his metrics and his numbers, he's about a 4.85 on the laser in the 40. Uh, Shows some maybe ability to, ability to extend plays, but he's definitely not like John Rice Plumley for Ole Miss or anything like that. So you would be the recruitment here, he's going to take official visits to Oregon. I think Oregon is this week. 
Um, Oregon would also need a quarterback, obviously, after their quarterback is trending to the NFL hard. He came back at, he, for, for another season instead of turning pro last year. That's Justin Herbert, of course. Then you've got Ohio State in the mix for a later official visit. Will he give another California school another official visit? The thing, though, here with C.J. Stroud is, is that also he has decided to elevate and escalate his timeline where he can graduate early after this semester in December, and he plans to be with his new team in January of 2020, and that will be right after he takes, takes part in the All-American Bowl. So you asked a question a moment ago that to me doesn't come across like a rhetorical question. When a, a quarterback like this is potentially in the mix for Georgia, potentially in the mix for a school like Ohio State, why isn't he already committed somewhere, and why isn't he, you know, given the fact that he was the Elite 11 MVP, a lot of good quarterbacks, you know, certainly, you know, fall, you know, quite short of an honor like that. Why isn't he the centerpiece of somebody's class, recruiting hard to bring guys with him to blah, blah, blah school the way that a lot of these quarterbacks typically are? What is it about his either personal strategy to kind of be the last quarterback standing, making a decision, or what, something that's upended and prevented him from choosing another school prior to this? Why is a guy like Stroud still on the open market? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the best way to, 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 to discuss that is just to bring up that Brennan, his stock really shot up over the last six to eight months. He went from maybe a three-star a year ago as a junior to maybe a, a top 18, top 15 quarterback prior to the showcase circuit and prior to all those All-American type camps and the opening events. And his stock just kept going up and up and up. And it's interesting, the timeline there kind of intersects with this. the trend is Schools like to kind of get married up with a um, with their elite passer well in advance of the junior season or before the junior season. Think about names like uh, Harrison Bailey, how long he's been committed to Tennessee. Think about, I mean, it's just kind of the norm where D.J. Ungale was a guy that kind of waited until, you know, the spring, right around May, June before his senior year. Well, a lot of these schools, um, when they have an entrenched starter, they like to make sure that the backup coming – gets done before the, before the senior year. And so a lot of those schools that C.J. Stroud was looking at at the time have been upended or basically bypassed by a lot of high-rise, big-name programs like a Georgia, like an Ohio State, like an Oregon, like a USC, like a UCLA, because simply you can just look at it as a matter of his, his stock is shot way up and all the big programs that hadn't married up with a quarterback yet um, – they weren't the ones that did, that they weren't the ones that had an immediate job coming open in 2020, regardless. So that's why a lot of other players and a lot of other schools got figured out and got kind of had their arranged marriages well in advance. And that's about the time C.J. Stroud was blossoming as a prospect. All right, I got more questions for Jeff Sintel, including a chance to allow him to react to the Lawrence Cager injury here in a moment. Before that, though, let me tell you about my friends at the Atlanta and North Georgia Building Trades Council. You know, for those of you who do construction work for a living, this is a really important organization for you to know because the ANGTBC is dedicated to the work and the economic stability of organized construction workers in North America. They're creating more work opportunities, living wages. They're protecting your benefits. You can also earn while you learn with no tuition apprentice training. I'm talking about up to $100,000 while you're serving your apprenticeship. They also offer employer paid pension and insurance as well, and their wages are up to 30% higher than non-union workers. That's a great deal for those of you who do that kind of work, and this is not just men. Women encouraged to apply there as well, so a couple ways for you to get in touch, and if you're watching on video, you see it on your screen. It's 404-584-0005. That's the number, 404-584-0005, or online, angbtc.org. That's angbtc.org. That'll get you in touch with the Atlanta and North Georgia Building Trades Council. All right, Jeff, the Lawrence Cager injury news is out there. Ankle situation going back to Wednesday. Future in doubt for him for the rest of the year. The statement that I made before you joined us was, this is obviously a serious injury just given the statistical value that Cager's had to UGA, but this is not a reason that Georgia shouldn't win the SEC. And if Georgia doesn't win the SEC, this won't be held up as an acceptable excuse to, by you know fans, media, just sort of general uh, observers here. A team as deep as Georgia is supposed to be able to withstand an injury like this to Lawrence Cager. So with that in mind, I give you the floor to say, how will they do it?
and it's about due to lose Jeff 10 minutes into the interview, so we'll see if we can kind of get him uh, back up and running there in just a moment. We'll see if we can uh, square away things with uh, Jeff Sintel. Also, apologize for the little bit of a uh, little bit of an echo there with Jeff on the line. We're certainly aware of that and efforting to fix that, so I apologize for that, but I am curious to get Jeff's thoughts on the uh, Cager thing, so we'll do that with him uh, coming up here. And, of course, those of you who are typically part of Dog Nation, only presented by Kroger, know these kinds of phone things seem to pop up from time to time. <laughs> I jokingly say that a lot of this stuff isn't quite as easy as we make it look, you know, from a technical standpoint, so I'm really grateful for all the people who help us. Connor Riley included, Michael Carvel, and everybody else are going to help keep this show on the air and keep everything kind of smoothly rolling down the tracks. And, of course, Jeff Sintel for joining us there, too. By the way, before we're done today, more thoughts on some of the other games around the SEC. Crazy situation, the Egg Bowl last night. We'll talk about that, previewing a lot of the games for both today and Saturday. So we'll kind of touch on all of those bases here up and coming. We'll hear a little bit more from uh, Kirby Smart and set the stage for tomorrow in Atlanta. Or the early indication, at least the best I can tell, the uh, weather is supposed to be stellar. So uh, looking forward to that uh, in the clean, old-fashioned hate with Georgia and Georgia Tech. All right, let me bring back in uh, Jeff Sintel here. So Jeff, to kind of set up the question, how does Georgia withstand the injury to Lawrence Cager? Yeah, so most people say two, most people say two things. They go through and they go, can, can Georgia win this game without uh, Lawrence Cager? Well, look at the Auburn game. I think Georgia needs to find just that guy, that go-to receiver, in order to make that happen. That's the main thing you got to look at. Tom McBlaylock did that against Auburn. Lawrence Cager was largely not available for that game. That said, Georgia is a totally different, different offense this season when Lawrence Cager is in there because that gets guys like Blaylock and guys like Pickens going against the number two and number three corners instead of the number one or number two corner. When everybody moves up a spot in the rotation, like, kind of like the go-to guys in a, in a big spot. I, but you were talking earlier how Georgia basic Georgia fans really can't pin the blame on that because Georgia should have the receivers in the program to do yeah. that. Sure, sure, probably their most two overall talented receivers are just freshmen. But look at the, the, the talent Georgia has brought in. The first two top five receivers are Blaylock and Dickens. you got to remember, Demetrius Robertson is a transfer Hasn't been totally healthy all year, but he has five-star talent. Some of that elite speed as well. Some of the same type of speed that Georgia's trying to recruit in the 2020 class. The main thing is this is just the time where Georgia should have guys here. Jackson is really healthy now. He started the last four games of, of the season for the Bulldogs. He looks like he's getting in the form after that wrist injury cost him about a third of his, of his redshirt freshman season. So you look up and down. There's names like Tommy Bush. There's names like Matt Landers. There's, there's guys that have to have been in order for this receiving core to be a, a strong SEC receiving core, not just an elite receiving core. Those guys have had to pop and flash a lot more than they have, than they have so far. It looks to me, if you're going to win this game without Cager, and that's looking all the way to the LSU game, that you just need to have big games from Pickens, big games from Jackson, big games from Robertson and another big game in a big spot or at least one big shot play from a talent like young Blaylock. So here's the way I'll respond to that. And I think some people are going to think I'm joking, but I'm actually being serious. And I know not every Georgia fan is going to love this. I agree with you that you've eventually got to make the explosive throw at some point in time. And against Auburn, they did that with Blaylock. Uh, obviously Pickens had his moment against Texas A&M, but ultimately I think the best way to withstand the cager injury is to do two things a lot that Georgia fans don't always love. And admittedly here, even on dog nation Delhi presented by Kroger, we've criticized a bit there as well. I think you need stubborn runs and I think you need check down throws. I mean, when we showed the David Hale stats a little earlier about the difference with cager on the field and off, I mean, one of the biggest difference is the overall completion percentage. You know, Fromm completing about 45% of his passes when Cager's not on the field. It's obviously been three straight games of less than 50% completions for a guy who made the hallmark of his entire career, the accuracy up to that point in time. Jake Fromm has always been a very accurate quarterback. I believe that's his one truly elite skill, his ability to kind of throw the ball into a mason jar. He's just typically been a really accurate quarterback. Jeff, that's the thing against LSU, not to kind of look past Tech too much, but obviously this is the big game on the rise and the Cager injury impacts that greatly. You know, 
I, I think against LSU, the recipe for Georgia is they've got to find some easier throws for Fromm to make, some completion percentage boosting throws, some check down throws. And if those can come on second down, setting up a third and short situation, then all the better for a team like Georgia, which is going to run the ball to win anyway. So I know a lot of times Georgia fans don't like the idea of short, easy check down throws, stick routes, tight ends, things along those lines. And they don't like the idea of a stubborn run. Georgia kind of staying with that even when other teams are stacking the box to stop it. But without Lawrence Cager, with all due respect to Blaylock and and Pickens, I do believe uh, that those two aspects are a really important part of that uh, game plan, staying ahead of the chains by just kind of doing the things that Georgia has always done well. I think that's the recipe for withstanding the Cager injury. Uh, Brandon, I've got another better recipe for you, and it's better than your brother-in-law's secret stuffing, or it's better than the grandma bringing her collection of blueberry, pecan, or whatever type of pie you want to imagine. The recipe, Brandon, is DeAndre Swift. And for, for him, that is a game where he needs to get 25 touches, 25 touches. He needs to catch the ball out of the backfield. And that's how Georgia will beat LSU. I think it gets it away from the narrative about Georgia trying to get deep with finding four grabs for this receiver for 80 yards and maybe one big strike for this receiver. I think the way Georgia wins that football game is DeAndre Swift does basically what he did at the end of that Texas A&M game, and he goes, okay, here's more NFL draft, first round, second round, audition reels for Roger Goodell's league to check out because that's the way Georgia wins that game is with strong doses of DeAndre Swift. All right, Jeff, happy Thanksgiving. Really appreciate you being with us. I look forward to seeing you in Atlanta tomorrow for our Kroger kickoff show, for our Pella Window postgame show, and, of course, a lot throughout the game at the forum at forum.dognation.com. We appreciate you being here today and hope you have a tremendous continuation of your Thanksgiving weekend. All right, guys. See everybody on the flats. Have a good day. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. I'm sure I'm the only one who doesn't know this, but I always hear people say, hey, see you on the flats, Georgia Tech. Like, what are the flats exactly? I've never quite understood exactly what those are, but I guess that is where we'll be tomorrow there at Bobby Dodd Stadium, what does they call it, Historic Grant Field. So uh, Georgia will certainly, it's made it, it's, it's home now for quite some time, hasn't lost it since the controversial 1999 game. And uh, we'll look forward to getting another win, hopefully tomorrow, against Georgia Tech. We'll talk more about that a bit later on. For now, though, let's go cruiser in the SEC, courtesy of our friends at Royal Caribbean. By the way, boy, I know this is a time where a lot of folks like to sneak away for a cruise vacation. That Thanksgiving week is actually a really good time to do that. When you're kind of thinking about your own upcoming cruise vacation, the all-new Amplified Oasis of the Seas is a great choice. I mean, they have done so many things to make this ship bigger and better than ever before, whether it be the Ultimate Abyss, which is the tallest water slot at sea, all kinds of like bar, restaurant, nightclub, additions, music hall, playmaker sports bar and arcade, the lime and coconut, the all-new Bionic Bar, which is like a robotic arm that kind of uh, serves your drinks and makes your drink. It, it's just kind of an amazing, amazing experience. And it's, it's a great chance to get away. Family, friends, whatever you want to do, whoever you want to take with you. It's something for everybody at Royal Caribbean. And you go to royalcaribbean.com and you can kind of search around and see all the options the ships provide, the various ports of call, and also... Uh, to get in touch with the travel advisor to help get your travel book. It's royalcaribbean.com for a lot more on that. So I'm a big believer, and I've said this for a million million years. The best rivalry on college football is not the Iron Bowl. It's not Michigan-Ohio State. It's not even Georgia-Florida. The best rivalry in college football is the Egg Bowl rivalry between Ole Miss and Mississippi State because there aren't two programs in college football that hate each other more than these programs do. And there's a certain aspect of – train wreck stuff when these two teams go on the on the, uh, on the field together. It's almost like watching bum fights on YouTube where it's like, I shouldn't be watching this. This is not a very classy thing, but it's such a spectacle. It's kind of hard to turn away, and the Egg Bowl never fails to disappoint in regards to that, and last night was kind of another example of that. Elijah Moore, ironically, one-time UGA commit, scores what looks to be the game-tying touchdown, then has a – this is a phrase I never thought I'd say on Dog Nation Daily – simulated urination that leads to a 15-yard penalty, backs the kicker up for an extra point. He misses that, and Mississippi State goes on to win at home and, by the way, becomes bowl eligible with the win, 21-20. After the game, (laughs) the latest SEC coach to use profanity in his post-game press conference was the uh, Bulldogs' Joe Moorhead saying that basically that they were going to have to drag 
his Yankee expletive out of Starkville, that he was here to stay, essentially saying that, after he was pretty embattled and at one point in time might be thought to be in the mix for the Rutgers job because he'd worn out his welcome at Mississippi State. These programs are not classy. They are far from it. But when they get together, it's always pretty good TV. And last night was another example of that and a real bad loss, I think, for an Ole Miss team who handled its quarterback situation weird. To me, John Rice Plumley's the guy you're supposed to be playing for the full game. They go to Corral. Matt Corral does make a big throw on a fourth and forever type thing that set up the touchdown. But kind of an odd way to handle this for a Matt Luke and his offensive coordinator, Rich Rodriguez. And, you know, I think the momentum coming into the game would have led you to believe this is supposed to be an Ole Miss win, even though Mississippi State was the home team and kind of a sly favorite there. But uh, the Bulldogs do get that win. And the Egg Bowl, once again, is kind of the uh, spectacle that we all kind of enjoy seeing. They're like, you know, sort of typical Halloween or, or Thanksgiving type traditions that let us know that we're really, you know, turning the page towards Christmas. You know, for some people, it's the. It's the turkey, the dressing. You know, for other people, it's 15-yard penalties in the Egg Bowl between uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Just another incredible display between those two teams there uh, last night. Also, as we kind of cruise on here through the SEC with our friends at Royal Caribbean, let's turn our attention a little bit to the other games for the uh, weekend. Let me do Saturday here for a moment, Iron Bowl. And, you know, you'll be able to see later on the Dog Nation video channels today our Go With The Flow presented by R.S. Andrews, where I make the case for – not just an Auburn covering of the spread against Alabama, but the possibility of an Auburn outright upset here in this game. I just think you're asking Mac Jones, the new Alabama quarterback, to do something that Tua Tungo Vailoa, for the most part, didn't do, which was step up and play well against one of the better defenses he's going to see. You know, there was a number at AL.com yesterday. Nine win Auburn teams are undefeated against Nick Saban. Now, you may say, what does that mean? And honestly, probably doesn't mean much. But if you want to look at just the Gus Malzahn era alone, when Malzahn's had a good team, a ranked team, when he's had talent at least similar to what Alabama puts on the field, Malzahn's game plan has been good enough to beat Alabama in the past, good enough to keep it close with Alabama. I think I think Saturday's another example of that being true. I've given the number a million times. Chris Felica, the uh, Bear, is the one who's going to put it out there. Last seven times, Alabama's been a favorite of less than seven points. They're just three and four straight up in those games. They've only only covered once in that instance. Alabama's really good at dominating overwhelmed opponents, but not always really good at winning the chess match that goes along with a somewhat equal rival. And Auburn, with the talent that it has, especially the defense playing in its own stadium, I mean, go back to uh, 2017 here for a moment, proved to be uh, Alabama's equal and proved to be able to win that game. The Iron Bowl, a lot of folks think Alabama needs like this 21-point win to kind of show the committee that it's a legit playoff contender. Alabama's, I believe, is going to be fighting, scratching, clawing, doing whatever it can to simply win the game. I think this is going to be actually a pretty good TV product on Saturday. Clemson and South Carolina, this is by far the best defense the Tigers have seen in quite some time. This is only one of two top 25 defenses for them all year long, at least on the basis of the uh, Football Outsiders FEI defensive efficiency uh, you know, metric. The last time that Clemson played one of these kinds of defenses was A&M back earlier in the season. They won the game 24-10, but this is kind of a scuffling time for the Tigers. I think there's a chance that South Carolina's defense, the fact that it's playing at home, the fact that Muschamp's actually been better against the spread than you might think, I think there's a chance that the number's 27 here, that the Gamecocks could make this a little bit of a game, could make this worth watching. Obviously, Clemson's incredibly motivated. Dabo talks all the time about the SEC. He likes sending messages where that's concerned, given the fact that he's a little self-conscious about just how weak the ACC is overall. But South Carolina, at least defensively, may be able to do enough to make this less than a kind of a beauty contest type win for uh, Clemson. Let me kind of bounce to a couple of the others real quick. We've talked already this week about the bad blood that exists between LSU and Texas A&M going back to the 74-72 overtime win last season where after the game there were allegations of fisticuffs and depending on which newspaper you read, which post-game video you saw, your feeling with fisticuffs could have been quite different. There were allegations of punches. Turn, come to find out, some of that may have only been pushes and shoves. Some of that involved uh, relatives to Jimbo Fisher, Damian Craig, the former LSU staffer was alleged to be involved in some of this kind of stuff. There's a lot on the internet about just how nasty it got after the game between LSU and A&M. And what's the line from uh, the Game of Thrones with the North remembers? Well, apparently the folks in Baton Rouge remember as well because they are ready to go and ready to host Texas A&M. And really the ultimate, I guess the biggest storyline of all in this game might be the fact that Scott Woodward, now the LSU athletic director, good friends with Jimbo Fisher. I wouldn't be surprised if the real motivation in this game for Ed Orgeron is to kind of let him know Scott Woodward that 
he's actually the better coach in comparison to Jimbo Fisher. There's a lot out there about guys that LSU would have preferred having over Orgeron. Orgeron's turned out to be the right coach by, by a wide margin. I think that Orgeron has a memory of a lot of that kind of stuff, and I think he uses this game against Texas A&M to try to prove that. Interesting to see LSU, the team that Georgia's about to play in the SEC championship, uh, playing the same team that Georgia played last Saturday. And then a couple other kind of rivalry things to get to. We'll kind of make that cruise around the SEC, courtesy of our friends at Royal Caribbean. Let me also just kind of set the stage for the rest of the rivalry weekend. We'll do some of this from kind of a point spread standpoint. So I, I mentioned those a moment ago. Let me also so, show you some of these others there as well, including Florida and Florida State. Uh, Gators looking for their first win in Gainesville against the Seminoles since 2009. They will do that there as a 17.5 point favorite. Uh, you got Tennessee, who's trying to get its seventh win, hosting Vanderbilt as a 22 point favorite. Cincinnati Memphis is actually today. That's an 11 point number. The uh, Tigers looking to get that big one in the Liberty Bowl. Really, a series of wins they've collected in the Liberty Bowl here this year. And then outside the SEC, You've got Wisconsin and Minnesota playing for the uh, Big Ten West. The Golden Gophers, a two-point favorite there in that game. Bedlam sees the uh, Cowboys of Oklahoma State hosting Oklahoma in Stillwater. Oklahoma's a 12-and-a-half-point road favorite there in that game. Uh, Ohio State and Michigan. Michigan hosting the Buckeyes. The Wolverines are a nine-point underdog. Let me just kind of go through some of these here really quick. Um... I think it's really hard to make a case for a lot of surprises with Tennessee or Florida. I think they win those games easy. I think Memphis is an easy pick against Cincinnati for the game that's going to be played on Friday. I kind of would like to see Minnesota in the Big Ten title game just to see Ohio State playing against a team we haven't seen them play yet. So I'm kind of leaning the direction of the Gophers as kind of a short underdog against Wisconsin. Badgers defense as of late has not been nearly as good as it was early, early in the season. That's a factor for me on that. Plus, Fleck has actually been better against the spread than you might realize. Um, you know, I'm going to make the case for Michigan here, but once again, that may be more my heart wanting to see a good game there between the Buckeyes and the Wolverines. But this is a this is a very good defense right now for the Wolverines and a challenge, I think, for that Ohio State uh, offense. And then Oklahoma, I just think it's been a while since we've seen Oklahoma dominate anyone. The idea they're going to win a rivalry game by two touchdowns on the road. They may pull the win out, but I don't know. I don't know that they're as good right now as folks at my bookie seem to think they are. But that's the uh, numbers and everything to keep in mind for the upcoming slate worth of rivalry games. It is our my bookie best bets of the week, brought to you by our friends at my bookie. And of course, you can find my bookie online by simply typing it into your browser, and the internet will do the work for you. M Y B O O K I E. And then when you get there. Uh, to my book, you use the promo code Dog Nation. They're going to give you something. A big first deposit bonus. You can get up to $1,000. You can get your first deposit doubled. And they'll kind of set you up with an account that already has more money in it than you started with. And then after that, you just simply play, you win, you get paid. My book, he's known for the best player perks in the industry and the fast, no hassle payout when you do win. And a big first deposit bonus when you use the promo code Dog Nation. So find my bookie online. Use the promo code Dog Nation. And after that, well, we wish you the best of luck with the picks you'll make here this weekend. All right, here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger, let's turn our attention back to Georgia and Georgia Tech here for a moment. What's going to happen on Saturday? In the ways in which Georgia's preparation for this game has been made different by the fact that Paul Johnson is no longer the coach at Georgia Tech. A lot of Georgia players talked about that a bunch this week. That was a big topic of not getting your knees taken out from underneath you with all the chop blocking and cut blocking that Tech was famous for back when it was running the triple option offense. It's also a difference for coaches as well. They don't have to spend as much time during the season devoting time to get the scout team ready to run a triple option offense for the week that it really matters before you play Georgia Tech. That was the identity of the Georgia-Georgia Tech rivalry for a long time, and Kirby Smart talked this week about what makes this week's game different for him the past year's worth of time getting ready for the game, knowing there's no triple offense waiting for them in Atlanta anymore. Here's Kirby on that topic. Well, I don't know that it was unknown. I mean, Jeff Howard's an offensive coordinator. He has an offensive staff. You know what they do. So you try to plan based on that. You know, we, we get to watch. We have a, a person that scouts ahead. It's, it's advanced scouting. So they watch teams that we're going to play, and we try to look down the road and say, what's going to be really difficult? What's different? Not necessarily, though, they got really good players. It's, it, you, you, you look at teams and say, what is it based on that's so different they do that we can't handle? So – we, we say, hey, Georgia Tech's got a uh, very different offensive system than what we face week to week. Even now, they're different. So during the off week, we took some periods and, and, and worked on some different things they were doing. But it's never based on 
who you play in the future, what their record is. It's what they're doing offensively or defensively that's different than what you see. So a couple things here for me on this. I haven't watched a ton of Tech this year. I did watch a little bit of the North Carolina State game, and the honest truth is, in the stretch of game I was watching, Tech was still running the option a pretty good bit. That's not triple option type stuff, but the chances are we'll end up seeing a decent amount of option stuff maybe on Saturday, at least based on the one little window of time that I watched them uh, on that Thursday night game a couple weeks ago. They were still running some option. It just wasn't quite triple option type stuff. Uh, But the other thing is, you know, I don't think any Georgia player liked playing against the triple option. I don't think that, you know, the idea of Paul Johnson having such a different scheme right there at the end of the season, I think that was kind of a nuisance for Georgia. I think fans kind of grew tired of it. Heavens knows Tech fans had gotten kind of bored with it, tired with it. They just sort of seen it become ineffective. I mean, Kirby in the 2017-2018 seasons had essentially rendered that triple option. I mean, he just neutered it, right? I mean, the way they stacked their linebackers and kind of took on the pulling guard, the triple option was just never going to work on Georgia again. They had just solved that puzzle. That Rubik's Cube had just been figured out. But when you had Johnson attacked, the one thing you did have was a little bit of identity for the rivalry. Now, from the Tech fan standpoint, it's not the identity they probably wanted to have. And even from Georgia fan standpoint, I'm not quite so sure the identity gave the game much juice, but it was the better talent of Georgia facing the unusual scheme of Georgia Tech. And the way it was largely covered by the media was, can Paul Johnson design something? Can he, can he become enough of a thorn in the side of Georgia to be able to cook up some sort of offensive scheme that neutralizes the overwhelming talent advantage that George enjoyed? And the answer to that question more often than not was no, but it was still an identity for the rivalry. Now that Johnson's not here anymore, it's almost like Georgia versus Georgia Tech doesn't have any identity whatsoever. And eventually, I know that Jeff Collins is going to be the guy who's trying to do the 404 takeover, and he's going to try to you know, compete in recruiting, and he's going to try to bring in you know, big-time you know, players. But listen, the most optimistic assessment of Tech's recruiting situation is they are years away from really being able to go head-to-head with Georgia on any player winning that recruiting battle. And the truth is, Georgia recruits so much nationally that even if Tech establishes something within the Atlanta area from a recruiting standpoint, the idea that Tech's going to be a recruiting nemesis and a recruiting rival to Georgia it's just not likely to take place. So for now, you have kind of a rivalry without an identity. It's got a nickname, Clean Old Fashioned Hate. It's kind of a cool one. And it's got a lot of history and backstory and everything else. But as far as present tense identity, it doesn't have much. I've always felt like it was the obligation of the underdog to kind of push, uh, push the issue, force the issue when it comes to a rivalry. And we'll see over the next couple of years if Tech is able to do anything that makes Georgia care whatsoever about Tech one way or another. We are interested in the game tomorrow, though, and with that in mind, let's do our Kroger kickoff here and kind of preview the weekend to come. Of course, you love kicking off the weekend thinking about Kroger, whether it be stocking up for your tailgate party, your game-watching party, anything else. And, of course, Kroger helps us get ready to go for the broadcast weekend in Atlanta as well, starting on Saturday pretty early, about 9.30 or so, for the Kroger kickoff uh, pregame show. We'll be there to cover the dog walk, at least to the extent there will be a dog walk in Atlanta tomorrow. We'll be able to cover that for you starting around 930. Of course, the game itself kicks off at noon, and the best I can tell, I'm no meteorologist, but it looks like the weather's supposed to be great tomorrow. High of 70 degrees, just a 20% chance of rain, so pretty nice weather, it sounds like, for clean old-fashioned hate there on the flats at Bobby Dodd Stadium tomorrow. Then after the game's over with, we'll get a chance to talk to Georgia coaches and players in the locker room, then come back out for the Pedal Window post-game show to break down what happened against the Dogs and the Jackets and If you know us, you probably know we'll also provide a little bit of a preview of what will happen the following Saturday back in Atlanta against LSU. So busy broadcast day for us on Saturday with pregame stuff, postgame stuff, all on the Dog Nation video channels and the Kroger kickoff, of course, courtesy of our friends at Kroger. And by the way, by the way, by the way, I know we've been telling you a lot about these uh, upcoming Vince Dooley book signings at various Kroger's. They've also got a couple other big events I want to make sure that you're aware of, too. And this is all going to be going down in like the next week or so. Uh, Muhammad Massaqua, the great former Georgia receiver, a guy that's got an unbelievable story of overcoming adversity, he's also going to be uh, popping out at a, a couple of uh, local Kroger's here. Uh, Thursday, December 5th from 5 to 6 p.m., he's going to be at the uh, Kroger in Bonaire, Georgia. It's uh, 774 Georgia Highway 96. And then the next day, Friday, December the 6th, uh, uh, Muhammad Massaqua is going to be at the Kroger in Athens on a Highway 29. That's 700 U.S. Highway 29 in Athens. So Kroger and Bonaire for uh, Muhammad Masqua on Thursday. 
Kroger in Athens for Muhammad Masqua on Friday. So uh, that's, that's all going down next week. If you go to dognation.com, you can kind of read more about this. But make sure you stop by the Kroger and Bonaire to meet Muhammad Masqua next Thursday from 5 to 6. And then the same time on that following day, Friday, December 6th from 5 to 6, they're at the Kroger on Highway 29 in Athens. Really cool stuff for Kroger this holiday season. Welcoming back the great former Georgia wide receiver Muhammad Masqua to various Kroger locations. All right, we'll get ready to wrap up our program. And as we do so, uh, I'll mention here really quickly that obviously you may have seen Anthony Ant-Man Edwards, another exploit from him, the buzzer beater shot against Chaminade, the Silver Swords, to end Georgia's time in Maui in the Maui Invitational. You know, so far, this Georgia basketball team is pretty much exactly the way we predicted they would be. Anthony Ant-Man Edwards has made this team thrilling to watch, and the game against Chaminade is another example of that. The ferocious near comeback against uh, Michigan State, also an example of that as well. This is a very entertaining product right now. I think, it goes, I think we're still a long way away from determining, though, is this actually a good basketball team? For as much fun as the game against Michigan State was, it is easier to make a comeback like that when the team that you're doing so at one point in time had a 30-point lead. And Chaminade is, after all, a Division II school. So coming back to the mainland, we'll see how Georgia used what happened in Maui to actually make a run towards the NCAA tournament. And by the way, Gator Raider Updater, 1,126 days. Happy Black Friday to all of you, and thanks for being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger. And on video. Good to have you with us here as a part of our R.S. Andrews cool down. Of course, uh, R.S. Andrews, uh, this holiday season, if you've got a water heater, heater issue, a lot of times those things go out when you, when you least want them to. And in many cases, if your water heater is actually out and done, R.S. Andrews can replace that thing for you in just the same day. So, you know, no one's got enough time this time of year, and everyone wants. If you have an issue with one of your major appliances, one of those major systems in your house, you want that thing fixed fast because you got friends coming over, family coming over. You're trying to enjoy the holiday season. R.S. Andrews can kind of help you get that peace of mind back, whether it be an air issue, a heating issue, plumbing issue, electrical issue. R.S. Andrews can do all of that for you. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. We have, I got about 11.06 here as we're doing this live. So why don't we say we'll do, let's do 15 or so minutes and try to get off the air as close to 11.20 as we can. I'll let you guys get back to your Black Friday festivities. So we'll get ready to do, we'll get ready to do all of that. Um, and of course, we'll try to take as many of your comments as we can. We appreciate you being here. And of course, appreciate uh, Connor Raleigh being here for us there as well we will hear from him coming up in just a moment and with that in mind i'll kind of pop over here to a facebook first and we'll kind of begin things on facebook and then see where it goes from there by the way happy thanksgiving to you connor appreciate you being here of course favorite favorite holiday of the year you know i had a very successful day yesterday had a wonderful spread mashed potatoes deep fried turkey all the fixings and trimmings it was a very 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 successful day yeah i'm actually one of those people that really likes the thanksgiving food now i don't want to eat turkey and dressing necessarily every day but um but i just really really like it uh you know some people would rather eat, be eating a different kind of food than thanksgiving style food and I, I get people who have different tastes in foods but uh the thanksgiving style food i actually really like it's hearty it's it's uh, mm -hmm. it sticks to your ribs. I, I just really enjoy it. We had some ham on the table as well yeah. yesterday, which I think is a big upgrade because I know turkey is not for everyone. And I myself am not even the biggest turkey fan. Uh, decided to go back home and dig into seconds and just pig out and watch some college football today. So there is something about uh, me that's changed a good bit here as I've gotten older. I used to really, really like ham and only tolerated turkey. As I've gotten older, I've almost flipped the, uh, the switch on that where I really, really like turkey and only tolerate ham. Let me tell you the power move yesterday. Putting a little turkey and ham together for each bite, that was fantastic. You got to mix them. So you get the fatty flavor of the ham to go along with kind of the lean smoothness of the turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's good times. That's also kind of the, the, I guess, the basis for a Cuban sandwich. Is that right? Yeah. And you, certainly the Cubans have that figured out because that was good stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, Pip Dean says Apar asparagus pie is the best. Is that real? Is there really such a thing as asparagus so, pie? Uh, that is my mom. Uh, and I would say that just about everybody has asparagus casserole. Uh, but the way that she does it is that she bakes it as a pie. And uh, we had a lengthy argument, or not an argument, but a lengthy discussion about the merits of it yesterday and how, you know, asparagus casserole is something you see quite often. 
on a on a Thanksgiving table. But for some reason, my mother wants to do it in a pie form, and I mean that had no business being on my plate, and it was not on my plate. But she she is very proud of her asparagus pie. Uh, Curtis Strickland wants to talk more about Lawrence Cager. Apparently, he missed the earlier part of the show, so we'll kind of rerun that here a little bit. The report from DogNation.com is is this is a serious injury that could end Cager's season. I'm assuming while. You know, we don't know this yet. I'm assuming that how deep into the year, into the future calendar year that Georgia plays will determine, I guess, if we see Lawrence Cager again this year. It is an ankle injury to go along with what has been a shoulder and a rib. I said during the show, and I'll say this again, that this is obviously a serious injury just given how statistically impactful Cager's been for UGA. But this, for me, isn't a reason that Georgia won't be, beat LSU. And if Georgia doesn't beat LSU, not having Cager won't stand as an acceptable excuse. He's been huge for Georgia. But Kirby said this during our program. Hey, you're supposed to have depth to withstand injuries. Georgia should have the depth to withstand this. No one would have said at the beginning of the season that, well, you know, Georgia doesn't have Lawrence Cager on the field. It can't beat anyone. No one would have said that. And so while... Obviously, the numbers would suggest the Georgia offense has been way better when it's had Cager. This is simply a problem to be solved and not necessarily a harbinger of doom. I think, the uh, again, when we're, we're talking and think about this game, the bigger question, for me anyway, it's is Georgia going to be able to stop Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and Joe Burrow? Not necessarily is Georgia going to be able to scratch out enough points. Because that we had, you know, as, as uninspiring as the Georgia offense has been this season, in those big games against Florida, against Auburn, against Notre Dame, and, and, and Cager was not out there for that, for that Auburn game, Georgia has been able to scratch out just enough points, 21, 24, 23 points. I think they're going to need 28 to win that LSU game. So, again, into the larger point that you made, Cager, you can't say, oh, you can't after the fact say, oh, well, we didn't have Cager in this game. I don't even think it's like – it's on the same level as, say, DeAndre Walker leaving the fourth quarter of the SEC championship game last year. I think that was a more significant injury to the Georgia defense than potentially what Cager is to this Georgia offense. So, so Cager has been great this year. So obviously I agree with you. The bigger questions for Georgia in the game are on defense, but that doesn't mean the offensive questions aren't significant. And to me, it's kind of a combination of both where you've got to hold them down below their typical season total, and you've got to find a way to sort of exceed what I'm, at least against Power 5 competition, has been your typical season mm -hmm. total. So there are some offensive questions for Georgia to answer, but for me, this is not as simple as saying, well, what Cager used to do, now George Pickens is going to do. Right. As I said with Jeff Sintel, this is for me more about the two things that fans hate. It's about stubborn runs, and it's about check down throws, because one way or another, you got to try to find a way to pad from stats a little bit. He's got to go back to being the accurate quarterback that he's been before, which to me means taking what the defense is going to give because now there's going to be excessive attention paid to George Pickens, which kind of means the pecking order of, of would-be George receivers. The more you kind of work your way down that, the more somebody's likely to be open. Easy stick route to a tight end. Finding a way to get an easy toss to Karis Jackson. The more you move your way down the hierarchy of George receivers, the more I think you find either some green grass or a favorable man-to-man -man matchup, and you just sort of take that, especially if it's on second down, setting up a third and manageable situation. That's boring, but I actually I believe that's the recipe for withstanding the cage or injury. Right, and you saw actually Georgia, when they opened the, the, the drive against the, the uh, game against Texas A&M, you know, yes, that first play to DeAndre Swift lost seven yards, but that second play, they came back and hit Charlie Warner on that stick route, and yeah. you're like, we should see more of that, you know. Uh, there was another play in that game, Karis Jackson on a slant on first down that was there, and he just happened to not catch it. Or I believe that was on third down. And, and to your larger point, like the Georgia offense, even with Cager, if Cager was going to be able to go in that game, he, Georgia was still going to have to try and punch above its weight offensively in that game. And yes, that becomes harder now, but Cager, from what we've seen of him, you know, he wasn't going to be 100% in that LSU game even before this ankle injury, and it was going to be a question of, as it has been all season, can he sort of balance the pain tolerance that comes with that and avoid taking hits to the shoulder and rib areas where LSU was almost certainly going to be targeting and trying to make him uncomfortable and knock him out of the game. So on YouTube, there's a lot of talk about the ankle being broken or not. I don't have any idea what the status of the ankle is, and I think the only thing that Dog Nation has reported is that it's a serious enough injury that he might not mm -hmm. play again. And... You know, that's Mike's deal, and I'd let, you know, as far as expounding upon that reporting, that would be Mike's job to do one way or another. All I'm going with is what's out there, which is the injury is significant enough that 
you know, as it stands right now, we don't know how long Georgia's season is still going right. to be. Georgia may be playing, what, as many as three more games, right? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, four. If you're counting Georgia Tech, yeah, four more games. Yeah, uh, so Georgia may have four more games. It may have three more games. We don't know how long the Georgia season is still going to be. So that would obviously determine whether or not we see Cager again. But I think the one thing that you can probably surmise, broken or not, whatever else, this was serious enough that it gets reported coming off what was a closed practice on Wednesday, right? Right. It, it goes back to, your, I think, your larger thing of, you know, there, there's a desire for information on this sort of stuff and, and things that are out there, but there's not enough. You know, Georgia's not putting out enough yeah. on it, so there's sort of a gap that it sort of has to be filled, which is where the speculation of whether it is a broken ankle or not comes from. And I, I guess... Just given the way that he was used in the Auburn game where it's like there, he makes a catch and we never really see him again, mm -hmm. I don't know that I was expecting Cager to be a huge part of the LSU game plan anyway. Obviously, I'm not saying that I knew for a fact that right. he wasn't going to be prior to the ankle injury, but, I mean, he's just been dealing with a lot of injuries, and it's the kind of injury that makes, you know, makes catching the ball tough, you know, because as soon as he takes contact, a lot of this stuff kind of flames back up again. I mean, I hate it because he's been – I mean, I hate it for him because, I mean, you must be having a good time if you're Cager, right? I mean, it's like you've been part of a Miami program that's not really been playing for anything of consequence. You come here to Georgia, you're a huge part of a team that's trying to win a national championship. One can only imagine that Lawrence must be having the time of his life. So to think that all of a sudden now this is called into question again by another injury and a completely different injury than the other separate injuries he's been dealing with this year – you want to talk about just buzzard's luck? for um, Not for Georgia, for Cager. This stinks for him because he's had a great year and he's been battling injuries every step of the way when the st decision to grad transfer has unquestionably been the right one for him. And once again, he's dealing with something that may keep him off the field. I hate it for Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, this is a game, the, the LSU game, this is a game he came to Georgia to play in. This is why he, he chose to leave Miami and come play at a place like Georgia where you have the opportunity to play in one of these games. And he'd certainly earned that right, given how awesome uh, he has been against Notre Dame and against Florida. And, you know, that Florida game, he still had injury questions going into that game. He'd missed the Kentucky game before, and he was sort of able to manage his way around not hurting his shoulder or hurting his ribs in that game. And it's just sort of a bummer for him that he's not going to be able to, you know, be the player that he certainly wants to be when Georgia takes the field against LSU. Jeremy Shipes makes an interesting statement on YouTube, and this is one that we should maybe pay more consideration to. Should Georgia throw the ball to Harrion more now that uh, Cager's hurt? Because gosh knows Harrion's got to pinch it for making some pretty big catches. You know, at, at one point in time, some of the ways in which James Cook is talked about now in the early stages of Harrion's career – he was actually talked about in some of those same same ways as well of a guy that might practice some of the slot position, might actually be kind of an interesting slot receiver type target. If you're looking for more guys to throw to, I, I bring up Swift's name on this a lot. I think that Georgia was good in 2018 when it threw the ball to Swift. Should Harrion be on the receiving end of more Jake Fromm throws? It's actually kind of an interesting thing to interesting statement to make. I mean, yeah, we talked we talked about this earlier in the week, I believe, off air, you and I. But you know, you think back, he made that wonderful catch against Florida. He was wide open in that Texas A and M game on a throw Jake just missed, and he is someone who cause we've wondered, you know, about DeAndre Swift's involvement in the passing game this year, and I think Harrion has sort of done enough this year to show that if he is the back that, you know, is coming out of the backfield and trying to sort of limit the wear and tear on DeAndre Swift, I think you're absolutely 100% okay with it. Here's an interesting comment from Dr. James Bernard Jackson. He says, Joe Brady outsmarted Saban, Kevin Steele, Joe Lee Dunn, Kirby is next. I'm going to apologize for this. Who is Joe Lee Dunn, the defensive coordinator for in 2019? I, I apologize for not knowing the answer to that question. But um, maybe it's Mississippi State. Oh, that's not true. Bob Shoup is the defense coordinator there. Um, anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. Let me just do Saban and Kevin Steele, the two situations I know the most about. I don't know that Brady necessarily outsmarted Auburn there that day because Auburn, for the most part, kept that one closer than the mm -hmm. experts would have said You know, on the road in Baton Rouge. The Alabama thing, listen, at this stage of the game, Alabama just doesn't quite have the horses uh, the, the way that they used to. But let me go to the larger point here. About, about Joe Brady outsmarting Kirby Smart. I think you're hard-pressed to find examples of Kirby Smart being outcoached by anyone, offensive mind versus, 
versus uh, Smart's defensive prowess and his top lieutenants, guys like Dan Lanning and Glenn Schumann. I really, as I'm speaking as a Georgia fan here, I've obviously got the Georgia sweatshirt on today. I really, really trust Kirby Smart in a battle of wits, defensive chess pieces against offensive chess pieces. So LSU may win this game. They're obviously going to be favored to win the game. They may just have too much firepower with Burrow and all the guys he can throw to. But the idea that that Joe Brady's going to coach circles around Kirby Smart, I don't quite see that necessarily being the case. You know, I, I, I just don't. And Kirby does, I right now, I believe, have more more pieces to use defensively than what Saban and Pete Golding had for Alabama. So the chess match of this game, I think, is going to be really fun. I don't think there's a clear. I don't think there's a clear winner in that chess match between what Brady wants to do offensively, Steve Ensminger to the extent that he's a part of it, and what Lanning and Kirby and Schumann those guys want to do for Georgia defensively. There is no clear advantage to me on either side of that. But don't be so quick to assume that Kirby Smart gets out coached by Brady, who's likely the Broyles Award winner for the year. You would say that in the 2018 Rose Bowl, Kirby Smart outcoached Lincoln Riley, correct? I, over the course of the full 60 minutes, oh, I do. Yeah. I, I think that Oklahoma offense was impossible to shut down. It was just too good. It was just too good to shut down. They had just too many weapons. But over the course of the full 60 minutes, Kirby Smart found a way to assert himself over the course of time. I absolutely believe that the winning coach that day, the guy who outsmarted the other guy for the full entirety of the game, was Kirby over Lincoln. I absolutely believe that. And as much as this might kill you to admit, you do you think that Dan Mullen is a pretty good offensive coach? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly he's yeah, he's he's certainly done done plenty to to prove that even if it's not quite as much as some of the guys on TV will tell you it is. And how do you think Kirby's done against Dan? Mullen? Yeah, I think I think that Kirby's done just fine there. I think Mullen's been fighting, scratching, clawing to have any success against Kirby Smart. Now, I do believe that Brady's probably a lot smarter than Dan Mullen is to be uh, completely honest with you, but not smart enough that he's going to you know, th- there's this caricature that gets drawn of Kirby that, you know, some guys play checkers, some guys play chess. Kirby's out there playing hungry, hungry hippos, and just banging and smashing and trying to just, you know, you know, brutalize the game. And I, I think that's I, I think that's a uh, an oversimplification of Kirby Smart. You know, I think that I don't know that there's anybody who loves anything more than Kirby loves defensive game plans for the both the good and the bad, the better and the worse. Kirby just really, really likes drawing up defensive schemes in the dirt. And so I think that he's eager to match wits against a guy like Joe Brady. I do. We are now up to the time we said we were going to get off the air, so let's do some of this here kind of quick. Barry Watkins asked earlier what has to happen for Georgia to play in a college football playoff game in Atlanta. Um, I think the scenario would be Ohio State has to lose one of its next two games, either at Michigan uh, on Saturday or against the winner of Wisconsin-Minnesota in the Big Ten Championship game. You have to root for Clemson to play close games against South Carolina and then either Virginia Tech or Virginia. And then you would have to hope for Georgia to win convincingly, against, somewhat convincingly, against LSU because I don't think Clemson is losing to either South Carolina, Virginia, or Virginia Tech. And I think you need to be able to tout Georgia's resume at that point, which would have wins over LSU, Auburn, Florida, and Notre Dame as those wins being more impressive than anything Clemson has on its resume, even though Clemson has a far superior ITS. Tom Harlow checking in from the beautiful island of Okinawa off the uh, coast of Japan. Tom, great to have you with us as a part of our program today. Uh, thanks for so much for uh, being here. So I thought it was very interesting on Tuesday that the committee finally started talking about something that I've been talking about now for a while. Prior to this week, I hadn't heard the committee mention a word about seeding up until now. But the ESPN guys, it's really the ESPN guys, it's not the committee themselves, but the ESPN guys on Tuesday were starting to talk about some of the same kind of stuff of who plays who. And we haven't gotten yet to the idea that one of these games is in Atlanta and Georgia could potentially be in that. TV's not talking about that yet. But given the fact that it seems pretty obvious that Clemson's kind of locked into something other than the number one seed right now, the opportunity to avoid Clemson starting to come up, and that's why the LSU-Ohio State toggling of one and two is kind of starting to matter. So we're starting to see the committee start to pay a little bit more attention to seeding, how that could impact. And I think that Georgia is almost for sure going to have the fan advantage in Atlanta uh, for the SEC championship game, and it could be significant, you know, especially given the fact that LSU fans may be saving their money for what they believe is a playoff game beyond that. So Georgia, which always has a little bit of a fan advantage in Atlanta, may have a larger fan advantage. For instance, Tuscaloosa last year just far closer to Atlanta than Baton Rouge is about an eight-hour drive from Baton Rouge 
to get to Atlanta, so there are probably not going to be quite as many LSU fans as you've come to expect. You better believe that if Georgia wins that game against LSU and it's one of these things where like there's Georgia fans making noise the entire time, which probably will be the case, that'll be fresh in the minds of the TV folks immediately after that. So Georgia getting a chance to play in Atlanta again will become a hot topic there pretty soon. I think, I think it's a huge, huge weapon. If you want to win a national championship, I think winning a national championship playing in Atlanta is just such an important part of this. I've been saying this now for the entire calendar year, you know, you know, almost 12 full months now I've been making the case for, for Georgia finding a way to get the game in Atlanta. We'll see how that goes. Can I also make one other kind of off the, kind of off the radar statement here for, for, sure for, for a moment? I'm semi-interested in the Virginia-Virginia Tech game today. I think it's noon on Friday, I believe, yep. today. I don't really know how many young players Virginia has. I do think they have a chance of winning this game, though, just because that's how topsy-turvy the ACC has been. And I think that rivalry games like this are a little bit more predictive for future seasons than bowl games are. Is there a chance with a win today that Virginia has talent young enough? Admittedly, I have no idea. But... Is there a chance that Virginia could earn themselves a preseason top 25 ranking, thus making next year's Georgia-Virginia 2020 season opener a battle of top 25 teams? I realize I'm putting lots of carts well before a great number of horses here, but admittedly I will be watching Virginia a little bit today to see if there's some sort of youth on that team justifying a nice rivalry win here today, better season than some people realize for the Wahoos potentially a top 25 matchup in Atlanta on the Monday night to open the season next year? The answer is no, because uh, Virginia's best player, quarterback Bryce Perkins, is this is his final season in Charlottesville, and they are very reliant on him to do a lot of things for them. And so I almost certainly think from a national perspective, Virginia is not going to necessarily get the credit it needs to become a top 25 team. And you mentioned the rivalry game. Uh, shout out to my cousin Brian, who is a Virginia grad. Do you know the last time Virginia beat Virginia Tech? I read this or heard this. It's it's been way longer than I realized. Thirteen years. Way longer than I realized. Thirteen years. And they've played every year over there. They play every year. I, I had not realized it had been Virginia that long. almost always finds a way to lose this game. And Virginia Tech is playing very well right now. They are two and a half point yeah. road favorite, I believe, today. Kinda like them as a pick. This team's playing well. Bud Foster, it's his final year yeah, there that's in right. Blacksburg. That's right. It's a big big factor. Justin Fuente Things got off the rails there for a little bit. They've sort of turned things around, and they are playing for a Coastal Division title today. So uh, I think this is a very interesting game to watch because Virginia is trying to come thir- overcome 13 years of futility uh, and try and win a, a rivalry game. And I know my cousin Brian loves to uh, flaunt the fact that Georgia can't seem to beat Alabama, but <laughs> Virginia is just as hapless, if not more so, than we're against Virginia Tech. A couple comments, and we're going to get off the air. Yannick? Kazadi says, B.A., do we still have an advantage if we face Clemson and Atlanta in the playoffs? So my simple answer to that question is I would say yes. I think that Georgia is going to have a formidable presence no matter who it plays, and obviously Clemson's very close to downtown Atlanta, only about an hour and a half drive or so. Um, but I think that Georgia would still have a, a very, very impressive uh, presence. The other th- bigger thing for me, though, is it's about avoiding the travel. I can tell you this, that having been in the Georgia locker room, of the Rose Bowl. I'm talking about not, like actually in the locker room because it's open locker room for media after the fact. Kirby Smart was, um, I want you to eat, fired up about getting the media out of that locker room so his team could get on the plane and come back home and get back to Atlanta and get ready for the national championship game. And that was different that year because there was only one week's worth of time in between the Rose Bowl and the national championship game. There's longer this year. Um, but if you could go Atlanta, Atlanta, New Orleans, as opposed to Atlanta, Arizona, New Orleans to win the national championship, it would just be way easier. I can tell you that Kirby was very concerned about his team's travel, uh, going back to the Rose Bowl of 2017 compared to Alabama, that only had to go to New Orleans and then play the championship game in Atlanta, which is a you know fairly easy trip for the folks in Tuscaloosa to make. So this is not just about the crowd providing an impact for Georgia, although I do think that would matter against most of the teams that would play. This is about avoiding that big, big travel. And admittedly, this is also about me being able to be with my family over the course of Christmas here in the great state of Georgia. But nonetheless, apart from me, if you can avoid that travel, I just think winning the national championship is far easier if you can do that. Yeah, I brought up uh, 
the possibility that I might be spending Christmas in Phoenix if uh, Georgia were to beat LSU. And uh, let's just say my parents were okay with it. Yeah. But you could tell they were very much not thrilled at that prospect that day. Green Soldier says, who's your pick to make up for the absence of Cage or a combination of Jackson and Pickens could fill part of that role? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think Green, Pickens becomes your number one receiver now. But I think Blaylock's emerging at the right time. And I do think that on down the hierarchy, you mentioned Kiaris Jackson, guys like that could actually have additional value because that may be where your mismatch is. You know, the third best, fourth best cornerback for LSU battling against a guy like Kiaris Jackson, that may be where you find a few easy throws. You're going to have to throw to pick in some to go for the big plays, but there's no such thing as an easy throw to him because he's going to have, you know, guys drapesing all over him all the time. And, you know, I, th- I think you're going to have smart coaches like, like Dave Aranda and Ed Orgeron they're going to work the refs before this game. They've seen how physical that, that Pickens is at the line of scrimmage. You better believe there's going to be a lot of talk about that with the officials prior to the game. That's just the kind of gamesmanship you get in a game like the SEC championship. So I think that you won't be able to make a lot of easy throws to Pickens. He's your number one source for big throws. But the easy throws you need to kind of stay on schedule, I think they're far more likely made with other guys kind of down the hierarchy. Uh, it's 1130, so this will be my last comment of the day. Uh, I think Georgia's going to need a lot from Kiaris Jackson these next couple of weeks. I, I, I think Georgia's tried to integrate him into the offense a little bit more, and now with Cager out for the foreseeable future, I think we're going to need to see a little bit more out of Mr. Jackson this year. All right, so uh, I'm wrapping up here, too. Um, uh, don't turn the microphone off yet, because I want to ask you about something, um, if you don't mind, please. Um... Somebody, Barry Watkins says uh, Robertson has to step up as well. So are we under the assumption, because Kirby didn't mention him in talking about injured receivers this week, is Robertson healthy or not? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we've seen he's played in games. He's had one or two catches in every game, but they have never really targeted him on a very frequent basis or tried to up his workload like maybe they have with guys like Pickens, Cager, even Kyrus Jackson to some extent. All right, y'all. Uh, good comments. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Enjoy the game against Tech on Saturday. For those of you who are going, come by and see us. We'll be all over the place, including Kroger kickoff before the game, kind of right out there. The, the, the dog walk at Tech is almost always the same place. It's that entrance right across the street from the old Olympic Village, kind of right there on North Avenue. That's typically where it always is. Uh, Tech does not like a bunch of folks gathering around that entrance, but that's kind of the way it's always kind of gone down. So we'll see if that's indeed the case there tomorrow there as well. Looking forward to that. Clean Old Fashioned Hate's one of these you know, cool things where like, I can remember almost every single one of them for the entirety of my lifetime. I don't make as big a deal about the tech thing. Obviously, we're big believers that uh, Georgia and Florida is the biggest rivalry that the dogs have, but it doesn't mean that tech's not fun to win and, and, and great to kind of beat up on, and Georgia tries to do that again tomorrow. So y'all enjoy the game. We appreciate you being here on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. Hope you have a great Friday. I'll see you back here Monday to talk about the Jackets, the SEC Championship, and, of course, everything else in between. Have a great weekend, everybody.